Imagine being able to take a 4-core processor and turn it into a 6-core processor just by installing and running some software. And no, we're not just talking about overclocking profiles or voodoo magic or performance profiles. This is software that physically makes more cores available and actually usable. So this is the history of core adding software. So how do you get more cores on a CPU or GPU without modifying any of the physical hardware. It's almost as bad as downloading more RAM off that sketchy site on the internet, hoping hardware just magically appears in your computer, especially for free. In this video though, we're actually talking about a real thing, and these actually work, they're not viruses. So to understand how we magically create cores out of seemingly thin air, we have to understand the manufacturing process that some processors go through. Processors, of course, are created by using light to form various electrical components in silicon wafers. These silicon wafers are then placed onto packages where they are tested, and some processors include multiple processing chips, like for example the new AMD Ryzen 3950X, which has two processor chips, each with eight cores and then one large I.O. die, and sometimes one is disabled in order to salvage the entire CPU or resell it as another product, say an 1800X or a 3800X, or a partially disabled to only 12 cores like the 3900X. So the lower core count processors usually come out first, like as we saw for the 12 core 3900X from AMD. This was likely due to AMD taking time to perfect manufacturing on both processor dies, Another occurrence of cores being disabled is if they run too hot or use too much voltage with all the cores. Sometimes though, when there is an actual problem with the core itself, maybe one of the main power rails was deformed in the lithography process, meaning that if you were to put any amount of voltage through it, it just wouldn't turn on. Another possibility is that the core requires so much voltage from a slight defect that it is still functionable but draws so much voltage it would degrade the core at a much faster rate. This would cause the chip to have a much shorter lifespan, maybe even one or two transistors are broken, but not enough to cause any issues at first. Factory testing is extensive and finds these problems, and you may not. You may be faced with random blue screens or crashes, and no matter how many times you reinstall your drivers to reseat your CPU, you won't be able to change it if AMD doesn't disable these cores. So these defective or undesirable cores are disabled in order to salvage the chip and sell it as another product. Sometimes nothing is wrong with the entire processor, but they are downgraded in order to sell or increase inventory of another SKU. During times of economic crisis <coughs> or extreme supply chain shortages, <coughs> we find chips that may be downgraded in order to sell more and gain more revenue overall. How they are disabled determines if software magic or voodoo magic, whatever you like to call it, can unlock them. And in cases where processors microcode determines which cores are disabled, some biases can trick the microcode in turning on some of these dormant cores. It's a gamble if the cores work, or if they are even usable, unless the entire chip is downclocked to a lower level. For GPUs, the process is mostly the same, except for the fact that you are usually dealing with a handful of cores on the CPUs, and GPUs, on the other hand, can have thousands of cores. Usually, GPU manufacturers will create different dies, one for the top-end SKUs, 1080, 1070, something like that, and then one for the mid-range, 1060s, 1060 Ti's, 2060s, kind of the same general market share there, and then one for the lower ends. That's why the TI, Super, and XT card SKUs exist. Well, not really for the XT, we can talk about that later. It is the same GPU die, but with slightly more cores or some cores disabled, depending on which way you look at it. With the slight increase in cores, they don't have to disable so many working cores to sell, and therefore can be more efficient with their production and get more revenue. The same dies are also used in multiple cards like 1080, 1070, or even say a Titan's graphics card really had problems in its productions. They could sell it as a 1070 and try to salvage as much money as possible. That is also why the TI, or super versions of cards, come out later as trimmed down higher end SKUs. They are stocking up on the higher end cards that had successful manufacturing processes in order to resell them as an entirely different SKU. Or maybe they're collecting all the ones with issues maybe the ones that only had so many defects to resell as an entirely different SKU as well. 
So now that you understand how some processors and GPUs are made, you can start to get an idea of how software Voodoo Magic unlocks them. By fooling the firmware into powering on these chips and treating them like normal, there is a chance that you can get full usage out of cores you didn't pay for. For GPUs, the firmware may be directing it to act like a 2080 Super, but in reality it is a 2080 Ti silicon die. So there is the potential to unlock the card. But we have yet to discuss one of the most potential, biggest problems. For GPUs, the firmware sometimes stores the information on what cores should be disabled. These could be power hungry GPU cores, or just plain out broken cores. If you were to flash the GPU to enable all the cores, you could end up with a perfectly working GPU, but more likely you end up with something that doesn't even turn on. You won't get the card to work right, and it will likely either crash altogether, won't turn on, or artifact. And when you want to restore it back, you may end up in a problem when you are unable to determine which cores have problems and can't flash back to what it's supposed to be, bricking your card. This is rarely the case for CPUs because the examples that we had did this well, and also the core software unlocking mods are on the motherboard and do not mess with the CPU microcode. We know what cores have problems, but the motherboard refuses to listen to that information and powers them on anyway. 2010 marks the beginning of these software modifications that unlock disabled cores. The first successful example of this being done was actually in a graphics card. The Radeon HD 6950 could be flashed into a 6970 to get an additional 8 texture mapping units in 128 cores, increasing its performance by 12% assuming the modification was successful. There were enough of these successful mods that information began to leak out. Just like that people were hooked on the idea of winning the silicon lottery in a different sense and getting more than what they actually paid for. The first largely successful software unlock was from AMD, which can, we can speculate if it was a marketing stunt to draw more attention to these processors in a time when AMD was struggling to keep up or compete with Intel. These chips were disabled at the surface level, the cores were not disabled by firmware or physically breaking something, but they were rather just suggested that you probably don't want to turn these on. And if the motherboard chose not to supply power to these cores, they wouldn't turn on. Yet if you did, they would potentially work. The motherboard could potentially ignore this recommendation and still power up the cores without any destructive software methods. Meaning if it turned out that the processor didn't work unlocked, you could just power off the system and reboot it as normal. Now this wasn't some back alley, I don't know, deal in the back of the corner where you get some weird software that does this. This was supported in actual motherboards. So this was a feature in motherboards for a good period of time. That is why I think it was actually sanctioned by AMD, but I haven't been able to find any proof of that as it's hard to develop a feature like that without any help from the CPU manufacturer. But now you're starting to see the pattern that was emerging. Products had a chance to be something more, buy a low-end product, and maybe you will get lucky and get more than what you paid for. But there is a problem. Large numbers of people went out and bought these low-end chips and returned the open processors that they tried and could not unlock, leaving a large number of used open processors on the market and a higher demand for the new processors. This is why this practice was casually unsupported from AMD processors and never adopted by Intel. Now today, almost all processors have physical modifications done to the silicon. Not almost all, they all do, I couldn't find a single example. To make it impossible to reactivate these dead cores. For example, if we're talking about the Ryzen series, it is impossible to unlock the disabled cores in a 3900X to get a 3950X. Casually, as time went on, this practice began to show its flaws as it was impractical in the long run and presented a large demand on the supply chain. AMD continued this practice for around eight or so years. In that time, Intel never adopted the policy and slowly over time, AMD realized what Intel already knew. It was a cheap way to sell products up front but caused the value of the actual processors to go down heavily once used because you don't know what you got. So making Intel products a much better value in the long run compared to AMD's at the time it really didn't work out well. As for GPUs, this practice is still possible in theory, though the most recent occurrence of this I could find was a Radeon 460 that was released in 2016. This could be flashed to unlock more cores, but could not be turned into another cart. This is kind of weird because while there was no higher end SKU for the 
GPU die, you still could unlock more cores, and this probably meant that they had originally planned for a higher end SKU, but were not able to get enough successful cards, so had to bump it down a level. This likely had, of course, issues if you did end up unlocking and it was successful, you wouldn't even get the graphics drivers to fully support it, and the performance might not even carry over, yet there was a pretty substantial risk. So there's also a potential the extra cores were added as margin in the manufacturing process, and since they didn't sell a higher end SKU at all, the disabled cores were just kind of either meant that their failure was very common in the manufacturing process, or they just never ended up adding in the higher end SKU. So AMD's latest release of the 5700 and 5700 XT actually have no core differences. This is what I was talking about earlier. The XT is just a higher bin GPU and does not have any core differences in the die. So the big question to ask is, is this magical days of core unlocking, lottery software ever going to make a comeback? No. And here's why. With the dangerous ability to permanently damage a card by flashing the card's BIOS to enable more cores that potentially have problems, it opens up a large amount of e-waste and RMA concerns. That's why no more of these cards are really possible. For this reason, GPUs are moving to physically disabled or already have moved to physically disabling and preventing it through software as well. So software modifications won't really do anything to the number of cores. This prevents a bunch of purchases in search of the lottery winner and keeps purchasing levels normal. Because of all these lottery searchers, GPUs will cost more too. And that's because we're adopting new technologies that make it harder and harder for people to actually unlock these potential lottery winners. The extensive testing and then going back to disable cores and developing preventative measures means that you'll have to pay more overall for your GPU as companies push that cost onto you, preventing people from trying to unlock hidden cores. CPU unlocking software won't be coming back anytime soon either. AMD learned that lottery searchers are actually a big problem when performance gains can be almost enough to double the performance for half the price. With the introduction of Ryzen, all cores are physically disabled in the silicon and prevent anyone from activating these cores for performance. So the times in which you can play the silicon lottery have passed, or at least the ones with big stakes are gone, so likely it will never be coming back. If you really want to get lucky, See if you can get one of the new 14 nanometer Intel processors though. That would be interesting if you can get it to run at least below something that can cook bake. So thanks for watching this video of PC history. Check out my last one on the history of Intel and have a good day and please be safe.